And good morning and welcome to everyone that's joined us this morning. It's a beautiful day, our first Sunday officially of summer. Mm -hmm. And to you folks that are joining us online, we extend a welcome to you. I want to talk this morning before we start our music about redemption. The word redeem is found 147 times in the Bible, both Old and New Testament. So it's, it's a very important redemption, a very important word. What's the uh, redemption definition regarding Christianity? We do not need to live in misery because of our sin. We do not need to mentally flog ourselves or pay penance because of our sin. Jesus satisfied the debt of sin. He has redeemed us. The price of sin's redemption has been paid. Our indebtedness is gone by faith in him. So in today's world, I'll just use some simple examples. Uh, somebody says, uh, don't worry, I'll look after the bill. Somebody walks up and says, uh, I paid off your mortgage. Someone says, God has blessed us, so enjoy your new car. And they hand you the car keys. Or someone walks up and says, after many, many years, I forgive you. In Romans we read, for when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath by the death of his son. Much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through the Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have now received reconciliation, redemption. And then one more verse in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. In the... In the Old Testament, the children of Israel had many names for God, for Yahweh. But one that means a special specialty to me is in the Hebrew, Adonai. Adonai. And it means he's the God of everything. He's master and he's sovereign over everything. And we can have that new life through faith in him. Okay, we're going to sing Ancient of Days, one of the one of the other song or one of the other terminology that God has. Let's stand together as we give him glory and honor. Blessing and honor, glory and power be unto the ancient of days. From every nation, all of creation, bow before the ancient of days. Every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory. Every knee shall bow at your throne. In worship you will be exalted, O God. And your kingdom shall not pass away, O ancient of days. Days. From every nation, part of creation, coming for the ancient of days. Every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory. Every knee shall bow at your throne. In worship, you will be exalted, O God. And 
Amen. You may be seated. We have a few announcements that we'd like to bring this morning. First of all, just once again to welcome you here. And I'm so glad you're in the building with us. And also those of you online, it's great to have you here. Uh, this morning we want to pray for the names in our jar. For those names are listed or on these little pieces of paper. Are people who are somewhat connected to us. Family members, relatives who still have yet to believe that Jesus Christ died to redeem them, I'll use your word this morning, uh, to save them, to save us all from our sin and give us freedom and joy. And so we want to pray for that. We also want to praise you, uh, praise the Lord for the generosity that you bring. Uh, we have uh, been blessed uh, since we've been here especially, but I think just overall this church is a very generous church and thank you for being generous and following the Lord's ask. He asks us to be generous like he is generous. And so I think we're going to pray for that as well as we uh, remember our tithes and our offerings. Now, there's a couple of things here. Uh, there's a few exciting things going on, obviously. And one of them is that we are going to have all the kids and whoever else uh, in a parade. And so I'm going to invite Tammy. Uh, she is going to come. She's our children's director. And uh, she's going to come and give us a little explanation as to what to expect. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> um, Hinton Alliance Church has decided to do the Canada Day Parade again this year. And so the kids will be riding bikes. They can come and decorate their bike or their scooter, their wagons, strollers. Um, adults are welcome to come too, to stroll, wave a flag, um, just have fun with us. There'll be music and bubble machine. Uh, <laughs> We're going to line up at 8 a.m. on July 1st in front of Mountain View School. And on Wednesday night, I know it's going to be hot. If it's too hot in the parking lot, we'll probably come inside the church to stay cool. We're going to decorate your, ba your bikes and your wagons, your strollers, whatever. Um, parents, please stay to help your child decorate their bike or whatever. Um, myself and my husband will also be available to help a little bit. But I think we're going to have so much fun. I'm so excited. That is great news. I love it. Uh, I don't have a bike, but I will be there. Uh, I'm going to pull the trailer with music, apparently. That's my job. All right. Um, <clears throat> this evening, uh, we have been involved in a 40-day fast, and it has been absolutely fantastic and lots of interesting and prayer, uh, prayer dynamic kind of things going on, not only for me personally and for us who have been involved in this personally, but also just in a, a general sense for our church, for the churches of Canada, 
as uh, we anticipate, especially for us in here in Alberta, you know, when we are free from wearing our face diapers, as I've heard them called. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. So we, uh, we are going to have a prayer time this evening. And uh, because the fast finishes on Wednesday night, uh, it's just easier than trying to be here and have this. So we thought we'd scoot ahead a couple days. And uh, so tonight we are going to have a prayer time and just a reflection and a sharing of what God has put in our hearts, what we've learned. And I think it's just going to be super interesting. There will be some worship. And uh, so we'll sing together, worship the Lord together, hear what he's been saying in people's hearts. Looking forward to that a lot. All right. Um, on July 4th, Next Sunday, the chairs will be back to normal. Hey, isn't that good? Absolutely. The chairs will be back to normal, and following the service, we are inviting everybody just to stick around. We're going to get a couple of cakes out and some uh, fruit platters, and uh, we're just going to spend some time together. Ah, oh, that just about brings a wee tear to me, one good eye. Uh, that is where we're going to be on July 4th, so uh, that means that, of course, this next Sunday, uh, we want to pack this place out. Wouldn't that be awesome? That would be so fun. So those of you online, don't forget, <laughs> we do have a church building, just in case you, did, you forgot, and uh, we'd love to have you all come and be a part of our celebration of Welcome Back. So we're going to do that next Sunday. Um, finally, I want to call up Pastor Ryan. He's going to come, and there's a special announcement that we want to make. Awesome. So I'm going to invite Montana up. We have a grad this year and we're so excited to celebrate Montana Quill. So she is grading this year, and I've invited her just to share a little bit about what is next for her so we as a church family can be in prayer for her. All right. I did it. So now that I've finished what my sister refers to as mandatory school, my education that I pursue in the future is completely optional. But while I do know that I want to attend university and get a bachelor's degree in the performing arts, I don't have the slightest idea of where I want to go. Instead, this year I will be attending the Peace River Bible Institute in Sexsmith this fall for a one-year fundamentals course. While there, I hope to learn more about myself and my faith get used to the idea of po attending post-secondary and making friendships that will hopefully last for years to come. Of course, I also want to find the portrait of my grandfather who used to work there and take a selfie with him. <laughs> the next chapter of my life is full of uncertainties, but there are three things that I know for sure. One, I want to be able to inspire others and I want people to see God's light in me and be motivated to get to know him for themselves. Two, God put me in an amazing family with awesome parents who will always support me in all of my future endeavors. And three, God is also always there for me as well. And I look forward to seeing what he has in store for me this year at PRBI. Thanks. Awesome. So if this were happening next week, I would have Montana go to the middle and I surround her. Um, but since we're still one week away from opening, let's stretch out a hand of blessing towards Montana and let's pray for her as she continues this journey. Father God, we thank you so much for Montana. We thank you for the ways that you are working in her life. We thank you for the strength and endurance you gave her to finish strong, um, especially with the way school has been this past year. We thank you for the strength and endurance you've given her. We thank you for the dreams and the passions you've given her um, in the performing arts. We thank you for the desire that you have grown in her to spend time um, growing in her faith, um, spending a year at Bible school, learning and growing, learning more of herself and who you have called her to be. We pray that you would give her an amazing summer, um, an amazing time of preparation, that you would uh, continue giving her vision and focus as you are directing her. We pray for her family as they surround her and support her in this time as well. Um, we love you, God. We thank you again so much for how you're at work how you've shown yourself at work in Montana's life, and we pray for your blessing over her. In Jesus' name, amen. So we just have a little gift for you. Happy graduation. All right, let's have a prayer for this and for our offering. Jesus, we are grateful for your goodness to us. 
And our response to that is to be generous as you are generous towards us. And Lord, we pray that you would bless the offerings that come in. Thank you for those who sacrifice and give in order to make sure that the kingdom of God advances. And we give you praise for that, Lord. And Jesus, we also want to lift these names to you. We ask you would open their hearts to believe. Lord Jesus, come and show yourself to them. Reveal your power. Reveal your glory. Reveal your holiness to them so that they can respond to the, in faith to the message of your good gospel. And that is that you love us, you died for us, you rose from the dead for us, and you've prepared a place for us in the future. So we thank you for that, Jesus. And we just pray that for the folks that their names are in this jar. And now, Lord, as we go into our worship time again, just be honored, be lifted up, be glorified, be exalted in our midst. For truly, you truly are the ancient of days. And Lord, you are wise, you are beautiful beyond description. And we just want to worship you this morning together. In Jesus' name, amen. is that we are called the children of God. I'm 
a child of God, washed in the holy blood. I've been given a new name. I've been saved by grace. You died and took my place. And now I'm dancing with Jesus. And now I'm dancing with Jesus. child of God, washed in the holy blood, I've been given a new name, I've been saved by grace, you died and took my place, and now I'm dancing with Jesus, this captain so you have made me whole, I'm a child of to be found, my soul without a maker. You heard me call your name, you pulled me from my pain, I've got the holy fever. Bless my soul, you've made me whole, I'm a child of Day. 
understand and time is in his hands beginning at the end beginning at the end the God you dream in one Father Spirit and Son the Lion and the Lamb
worship you this morning, oh gracious Heavenly Father, Holy One, Holy, Holy, Holy. The earth is full of your glory. We worship you this morning. We lift you on high. And if you be lifted up, you'll draw people to yourself and set them free. And so we glorify you this morning, God. We thank you for those in our fellowship who have come into faith over the last few months. Jesus, just bless them with your presence. Make yourself known to them in deeper and more powerful ways, for you truly are worthy. Father, you are also the healer. You sent the, the Son who is the presence of God. And so, God, we ask now for those who are struggling with their health, oh, God, be that presence of Christ in their bodies in their mortal flesh bring healing in the name of Jesus and father we just ask now oh God that as we turn our direction towards you the king of kings the soon coming king as the scripture says oh God I just ask that you would expand our hearts to receive expand our holy imaginations to conceive what it is you are and who you are and what you will bring with you on that final great day for truly you are Christ, our coming King. And we worship you this morning as that. And Father, we just pray now and thank you again for our president. President uh, Dave, just bless him, not just for this morning's message, but him and Agnes and the whole team that leads our alliance across this great nation. And they oversee the missionary effort that's going on around the world, and the international workers that serve Oh God, we just ask you to grant him great peace, great wisdom, great understanding. And Father, we thank you that through modern technology, he can be in the room, sort of. <laughs> and so now we just sort of collectively extend a great big hug to him, because I know he's going to want that. 
And so, Lord, we just thank you for him, and we just praise you, Lord, that he can be with us today by live stream, and uh, we thank you for that. Just minister to our hearts now. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated, and uh, Dave, are, are you there? Ah, there you are. I am here, Kevin Nickel, and uh, <laughs> I wish I was actually there in person. Our plan was for me to actually be in your sanctuary and uh, engaging in the worship. And I'm just going to be really blunt, buddy. The thing I missed the most was going to be a Kevin Nickel hug, like a live one. And and for those who have experienced that, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So here you go, my dear friends, you and your congregation. It's a virtual hug. It's like uh, eating food without calories. It fundamentally isn't that satisfying, but we'll do our best today. So what a joy to be engaged in worship with you as a family. That was incredible. I tell you, I'm sitting on a little stool and I almost fell off a couple of times because I was just so engaged and enraptured in the worship. I want to speak to you as a congregation. I want to speak to you as an extended members of my family in the Alliance. And I just want to say this over you. May the love of God the Father fall fresh on you today. Wherever you're at and whatever you're experiencing, whether you're uh, in the church building or at home or even driving in your car, that the incredible, unlimited, amazing, unfathomable love of God the Father would fall fresh on you. May it be like a weighted blanket that would just embrace you, hold you. And if you're feeling anxious or worried or concerned, that you would experience shalom. I love the fact that over the last several Sundays, you've been talking about Jesus, Jesus, our, our savior, our sanctifier, healer. And my, my theme for today is really the all-inspiring Jesus. And I, I wanna talk about the all-inspiring Jesus in the context of sustaining mission-focused passion in the midst of a global pandemic. And if I had a prophetic word to speak over you as, as Hinton Alliance Church, it would simply be the words of Jesus from our text today, which will be in Revelation chapter one. Listen to the words of Jesus. Do not be afraid. Jesus says, I am the first and I am the last. I am the living one. Oh, I was dead, but now look, it's actually a command. Now look, Hinton Alliance Church, open your eyes, see that Jesus is alive forever and ever, and he holds the keys of death and Hades. Okay, here's some radically good news for you. The one that holds the keys holds you. One of the former presidents of the Christian Missionary Alliance, L.O. King, said these stunning words. The genius of the Alliance is Christ himself. Our attachment to him is the bond that holds us together and determines our relationship to each other. And here we go. Our message to the world is Jesus only. And our mission is to make him known in his fullness everywhere. I am convinced that in this unique moment of history, we need more than encouragement. Oh, don't, don't, don't be surprised. We, we do need encouragement. I'm an encourager at heart but I'm convinced we actually need a fresh encounter with the awe-inspiring Jesus. It was like playing a multi-million dollar video game. A good friend of mine who's an Air Canada pilot invited me to join him and his co-pilot in the Air Canada simulator. And as we got into the, the simulator cockpit, I'll never forget, they strapped themselves in, I was sitting behind them, there was a large screen in front of me, and on that screen was several buttons, and each button would actually simulate a disaster that would happen as the plane was flying. And so my, my buddy turned to me and said, Dave, uh, you know, when we, we get the simulator up to 39,000 feet, feel free to press any button, and, and my co-pilot and I will have to settle things down and get things under control. It was like an incredible gift. Oh, come on, Kevin Nickel, you would have loved this. And so we got up to 39,000 feet and in the simulator, you feel everything, you're, you feel every movement, it's like you're really there. And so I pushed the button, fire in engine one. And the cockpit exploded with all kinds of bells and whistles and buzzers. And I, I watched the two pilots work furiously to get the aircraft under control. And before they caught their breath, I pushed fire in engine two and it all began again. And they, they, they worked so diligently to get everything calmed down. And, and then I pushed a button I wish I would have never pushed. 
It simply had the word decompression. And at that point, it's like the, the, the cabin, the airplane goes into a, 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 an unpressurized state and actually the simulator drops you from 39,000 feet down to 10,000 feet in a matter of seconds. We went into this really steep dive and one of us, I think it was me, screamed in a high pitched effeminate voice as we plummeted down to under 10,000 feet. Finally, everything got stabilized. And I'll never forget as my friend, the Air Canada pilot looked at me and said, do not push any more buttons. It was a wild ride. And friends, this past 15 months with COVID-19 has been a wild ride. And the temptation is to step back, maybe stand down, even check out. And the pandemic has dealt a significant blow to our spiritual passion, but also to our mission-focused passion. As I've been speaking to people throughout Canada in our churches, I hear these words often spoken. I feel more insecure than ever before. Some are saying that they feel more emotionally exhausted and less productive. Some have even said for the first time, I'm considering early retirement. This was interesting hearing people say, I'm seeing increased tension and division in my congregation over how to respond to the pandemic. This one really caught my attention. I had no idea how overwhelmed and sad I would feel by accumulated losses. One of my good buddies summed it up in three words, soul sucking season. The temptation in moments like this, however, is to multiply solutions and to minimize solitude, to kind of introduce new ideas and to neglect intimacy with Jesus. And I, I, I want to proclaim over you, could it be that the exact opposite is needed? Perhaps the key to energizing mission-focused passion in the midst of a pandemic is not by initiating new and innovative programs, but rather by a change of perspective. One of my favorite Old Testament Bible stories, it found in 2 Kings chapter 6. You probably remember it well. Elisha is in Dotham, and the whole Aramean army has surrounded the city, and they are going to take him out. And his servant rises early in the morning and sees the whole Aramean army surrounding the city in which they're in, and this is his exclamation. Oh no, my Lord, what shall we do? And is that not true of us? In the midst of crisis, in the midst of, of, of serious situations, is not our first impulse to say, what should we do? But listen to the words of the prophet Elisha. He says, do not be afraid. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And here is what I believe is the prophetic word for the Christian Missionary Alliance in this moment of history. Elisha said, O oh Lord, open his eyes that he may see. And as his eyes were open, he saw the angel armies of God that were surrounding the city. And I wanna to suggest to you that what we see actually determines how we live. And I'm convinced in this moment of history, we do not primarily need a different kind of doing. And, and yes, we need to get used to digital media and all those things. I'm not suggesting we shouldn't do things differently, but that's not the primary focus. It's not a different kind of doing. I believe it's a call to a different kind of seeing. In fact, mission-focused passion is actually ignited in a vibrant, unveiled, awe-inspiring vision of Jesus. The year is 96 AD, and the Emperor Domitian, a highly insecure man, instituted emperor worship, declaring that everyone must worship him as Lord and God. The church was under siege for not obeying Caesar's edict. Christians were being harassed, losing their homes, being in prison, murdered without mercy, overwhelmed by accumulated losses. And then John, a fearless leader, oh, I love this guy, <laughs> would not bow his knee to a mere mortal, was banished to the island of Patmos, a barren, isolated Roman work camp in the Aegean Sea. And in this place of isolation, limitation and humiliation, John did not receive a to-do list from God, thankfully, but rather what he did receive is what I believe God wants to bring to his church in this moment, a stunning revelation of the risen, all-powerful Christ, 
a revelation that revived his heart and energized his mission to the nations. Daryl Johnson in his book, Discipleship on the Edge, suggests that the book of Revelation is a peeling back of the curtain. It's about helping us to see the unseen realities of the future. And Kevin, you, you nailed it in your prayer. Jesus is coming back in all of his fullness as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Folks, I've read the end of the book and we win. Come on, this is radically good news. But the reality is also the unseen realities of the present. In other words, the book of Revelation reminds us things are not as they appear to be. 40 times in this book, you see the words I saw, 32 times the words I hear. And to the, the seven churches in Asia Minor, what they were seeing physically was a crazed emperor on the throne that was seeking to take them out. But what did John see? John saw that Jesus was still on the throne, that Jesus was still on mission, that Jesus was still drawing the nations to himself. Oh boy, you know, you go to Revelation chapter seven, verses nine and 10. After this, I looked, John says, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. And they were wearing white robes and holding palm branches in their hands as they cried out in a loud voice, full pause, listen, church, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. That is the reality. We peel back the curtain of all that we see and what do we know to be true? Jesus is on the throne and hallelujah, Jesus is not nervous. It's not. In one of the most desperate places of the planet, I recently heard the story of a family that was moved by the Holy Spirit to pray for their community. They were praying because COVID had ravaged their small community. And some neighbors uh, heard them praying and, and what was, was more, they were so intense with their praying that they began to, to, to wail and cry. And so the neighbors who were walking by thought there was something alarming going on within their home. And so they knocked on the door and they said, is everything okay? And the believers said, oh, we're fine. We're just, we're just praying for the families in our village. And we're asking God to protect them from COVID-19 and to give them hope. The unbelieving neighbors were so moved that they asked if they could stay and pray as well. And so they prayed together for over two and a half hours. And finally, as the neighbors were ready to leave, they, they said to the believing people, they said, well, well, tell us which idol we should pay money to. That was very customary in their village. And the believers said, oh, we don't have any idols in this house. We worship the one who has risen from the dead, Jesus Christ, who is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And they shared Jesus with their neighbors. And four of them that day came to Christ. As of the telling of this story today, right here in Hinton, over 36 people in that village have come to Christ. They are now planting a church for the glory of God. The community is being transformed. Oh, Hinton Alliance Church, what do you see? In Northern Iraq, we've been working with the Yazidis, a group of people that, that ISIS attacked in their, their villages in Sanjar and killed their men, raped their women, kidnapped their children. It was a stunning, horrific crisis for the Yazidis. We determined as the Alliance that we would go to Northern Iraq and that we would minister to the Alliance. And what our folks on the ground are telling us now, that in the midst of a global pandemic, they are finding more and more Yazidis that have come to Christ and they are now gathering them together into the first gathering of Yazidis, Christian Yazidis, in over 1,800 years. Come on, that's good news. What do you see? You see, the missional question is not what should we do, but rather what do we see and what do we hear? Oh, my prayer for our families of churches is that God would open our eyes, lift the curtain, remove the veil to see the living Christ as he is now. And in seeing him, our hearts would be set ablaze with mission-focused passion. I want to suggest to you that the key to seeing is really the right posture. Follow me into chapter one of the book of Revelation. And in verse 10, what do we read? First of all, I'm going to suggest to you that, that the posture for mission-focused passion begins with a posture of hunger. On the Lord's Day, we read in verse 10, John says, I was in the spirit and I heard a voice behind me. 
One of my good friends, Rob Reamer, says, keep praying for greater encounters with God and resolve to be ever grateful for what God gives, but never satisfied, always seeking him for more of himself. Here is John in isolation, humiliation, in a, in a Roman work camp in Patmos on the Aegean Sea. And what is he doing on the Lord's Day? He is enveloped in an atmosphere of spirit-filled worship. A.B. Simpson, our founder, said, oh, I thought I was filled with the Holy Spirit, but I wasn't filled to overwhelming or overflowing. I had a little bit of the ocean in the bottle, but God wanted to put the bottle into the ocean. Could it be in the midst of a global pandemic that God is saying to you, hit the Lions Church, expand your capacity for more of me, my glory, my presence, my power in your church and in your lives. Simpson went on to say, I had to learn to take him for my spiritual life every second to breathe himself in as I breathe. Oh, I love that phrase. And to breathe myself out so that moment by moment for the spirit and moment by moment for the body, we must receive. You know that I'm a revivalist at heart, unapologetically so. I'm a product of the Welsh revival. My grandfather came to, came to Christ in the midst of the Welsh revival. And they say about the Welsh revival that it was a revival that was birthed in spirit anointed worship. And before they would begin every service, and, and before I began this, uh, this, this live stream with you, this is what I prayed over, over Hinton Alliance Church. It was the prayer of, of the Welsh revivalists. They would pray this prayer before their services started. Send your spirit now for Jesus Christ's sake. Oh, send your spirit now powerfully for Jesus Christ's sake. Send your spirit now more powerfully for Jesus Christ's sake. Oh, send your spirit now still more powerfully for Jesus Christ's sake. And in the midst of spirit-empowered worship, the church was revived. And in less than five months, over 100,000 people came to Christ and the nation of Wales was transformed. You see, in the midst of a global pandemic, it's not gonna be better strategies or more effective methods, or even a more compelling vision. It's gonna be men and women full of the Holy Spirit, saturated in spirit-powered worship. You see, yesterday's anointing will never be enough for today's challenges. And as one godly leader put it, I love this quote, I need to be summoned to a private world that is deep and intimate and a public world that is bold and focused. You see, it's no coincidence that John's encounter with Jesus occurred amid a spirit-inflamed moment of worship. I wanna say this to you, and I think last time I was there, I probably said some similar words, that friends, we can be so, so afraid of wildfire and, and so afraid of false fire when it comes to the Holy Spirit that we accept no fire and treat that as normal. Not today, please. Never be afraid of the work of the Holy Spirit. Never be afraid of holy fire because the Holy Spirit will always glorify Jesus. Isn't that amazing? It's in the midst of spirit empowered worship that John sees a more glorious picture of Jesus than he's ever seen before. Hint at Alliance Church as you are filled with the spirit, you will know it because you will not be able to contain your love for Jesus. He will become more radically beautiful, powerful and majestic than you could have ever imagine. One of our partners in South Asia that we're working for has experienced devastation during the pandemic and, and also severe persecution from local authorities. All of their pastoral training facilities have been closed and they had to transition to uh, WhatsApp on their cell phones in order to, to train their, their pastors in these villages. However, many of the students are in places where it's really hard to get cell reception. And one young student was so committed, so wanted to be part of the training, so wanted to be enveloped in the worship and everything that went with it, that he took his cell phone, get this, he took his cell phone, left his village, raised it above his head, and began to walk around until he could get cell service. He finally climbed a tree, and there in that tree, he was able to get cell service. He built himself a tree fort, a little school place, and every morning, that's where he goes to hear the word of God to be enveloped in spirit-empowered worship. I gotta tell you, that's hunger. Oh, I wanna see that in our churches. That in the midst of this global pandemic, and hallelujah, I think we are emerging out of it. How will we emerge? I pray that we will emerge more hungry than we've ever been before. 
for fresh encounters with the Spirit of God that would open up fresh and glorious magnification of the Lord Jesus Christ. A posture of humility, a posture of hunger, which leads us to a posture of humility. John says, I I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And as I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. Later, we're gonna discover that these seven golden lampstands actually refer to the seven churches of Asia Minor. But more than that, they refer to every church down through history that names the name of Jesus Christ. This is talking about you, Hinton Alliance Church. And there was one among the lampstands, someone like the Son of Man. Andrew Murray says humility is nothing but the disappearance of self in the vision that God is all. What a powerful picture. John was overwhelmed, immersed, and enraptured in a vision of Christ that knocked him off his feet. Daryl Johnson writes in the book that I referred to earlier, Discipleship on the Edge. He says, I'm not sure, I I am sure he says, that as John sat on the rock piles, he was able to bring to mind all kinds of mental pictures of Jesus, and so can we. There was a picture of Jesus at Cana turning 120 gallons of water into vintage wine. There was a picture of Jesus in Jerusalem driving out the money changers from the temple. Jesus feeding the 5,000 with five loaves and two fish. Jesus calming the raging storm. Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. And Jesus himself outside the empty tomb. And every picture would help John. But in this situation, one of great fear, John needed more. Full pause. Hinton Alliance Church, so do we. He needed to see Jesus as he is now. So what did John see? He saw one like the Son of Man, a very interesting phrase, reaching back into Daniel chapter 7 and equating Jesus as none other than the sovereign Lord of all of creation, God of very God, King of kings. And this is what it says in Daniel chapter seven, that his kingdom, hallelujah, is an everlasting kingdom and his kingdom will not be destroyed. Let me put it to you really blunt. Jesus is building his church right in the midst of a global pandemic and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. His kingdom cannot be stopped. Oh, he's wearing a a priestly robe, which means he's a bridge builder between a holy God and sinful humanity. And the golden sash is around his chest, declaring that his work is finished. Oh, hear this, people of God. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In Jesus' name, I break the power of shame. I break the power of lies. I declare you free in Jesus Christ. He wears a king's robe. Jesus is a king enthroned above all rule, authorities, and powers. His head and hair are white like wool, like snow, ageless, infinitely wise, perfectly clean. His eyes are like flaming fire. Fire illuminates and penetrates. It sees the junk in our lives and hallelujah, it burns it away. No more secrets. Oh, in this moment of history, would we allow the penetrating eyes of Jesus to come to those places of our soul and burn away all that is not of God, heal our brokenness, restore our passion, set us free in Jesus' name. Oh, his feet, his feet are like molten metal. Doesn't this blow you away? Come on, strong, unmovable, burning away evil wherever he walks. His voice is like the sound of crashing waves, awe-inspiring, powerful, and calming. In his right hand, he holds the seven stars. These relate to the messengers who will speak to the church, but in that moment of history, they only knew of seven planets in the sky. And these planets were said to control the destiny of humanity. I gotta tell you, I think something else is going on here. It's the revelation that Jesus is the one who holds the planets. It's not the planets who control your destiny. It is the one who holds the planets. As we go to, to to first Colossians, we see that, that he is before all things. All things were created through him and for him. And he holds all things together. He's the Lord of the cosmos. And out of his mouth comes a sharp sword, a short blade, razor sharp for close up surgery. And I pray that in this time of, of COVID where there's been a lot of reflection, 
that you've allowed Jesus to do deep, close-up surgery in your soul to cut away all that needs to be discarded and to enable you to embrace that which will remain and that which will last. And then this last image. I think, I think John is so stunned by what he sees. He's grasping at how to, how to describe this. And he said his face is like sun shining in all of its brilliance. Boy, you know what it's like on a, on a hot day when, when you look up into the sky and you try to stare at the sun and you are so overwhelmed by the brilliance and the glory of the brightness. That is the face of Jesus. And I gotta tell you this, understanding it in the context, Jesus is saying, and all of my brilliance and glory is shining on the church and the church becomes a reflection of my radiance to its community. I'd love for, for there to be testimonies in your communities. We don't know what's happening at Hinton Alliance Church, but those people are radiant with something. The glory of Jesus is so ecstatically poured out in your souls that it's uncontainable, unstoppable, undeniable. The last uh, time I got to go overseas was in March of last year. And I traveled to a place in, in Asia, and there I, I met one of the pastors in a, in a very challenging part of the world. And in that part of the country, there were two mafias that competed against each other. And, and as this pastor shared his testimony, he said, I was part of this particular mafia group. I was raised in a mafia family. And he said, when I turned 20, my father came to me and said that, that the next day, my cousin and I were going to go to this particular bank and rob that bank. And so he said, that night as I, I went to sleep, I had a vision of the radiant, glorious Jesus. We're hearing this in many parts of the world where people are coming to Christ through dreams and visions. He said the whole room became ablaze with the radiant glory of Jesus. And then he said, he, he said, I heard Jesus say, I love you. I have saved you from me. This is my last call, come and follow me. And the pastor said, I repented and I followed Jesus. The next day I told my cousin that I was now a follower of Jesus and I couldn't rob the bank. And his cousin said, well, I guess I'm gonna have to kill you. And he said to his cousin, go ahead, I will go to Jesus. And then he smiled and said, I went to bed a Muslim and woke up a Christian. Wow. He's gone on to plant 87 churches in this country with 22,000 people on the internet that he's discipling. These churches have made such a startling impact in a positive way on the communities in which they are in that the local government officials came to this pastor and said, we don't know what you're doing, but you need to keep on doing it. Plant more churches, please. Could you imagine if Justin Trudeau came to the Alliance and said, plant more churches, you're making such a difference in Canada? Wouldn't that be amazing? Be incredible. Just recently, this, this last few months, the secretary of religious affairs in that country came to this pastor and said, we know that you need help in training pastors for the churches you're planting. Let us help you. We will find you buildings. We will find you resources. We will help you train your pastors to lead your churches. Where did it begin? A stunning, awe-inspiring revelation of Jesus. You see, when you see Jesus as he is, your destiny gets changed forever. And my prayer for the Alliance is that we would experience the inbreaking, the unveiling of the glorious Jesus as he is now, and that we would fall on our faces in radical humility. There have been times when I've been in, in worship that I couldn't stand on my feet anymore. I fell on my face because I was so overwhelmed by the beauty and the glory and the presence of Jesus. I want that for our churches. I want that for our leaders. Be so enraptured in the glory and presence of Jesus. Because where is Jesus? I gave you a hint earlier on. He's in the middle of the lampstands. He is walking among his churches right now. And I just wanna declare this over you. This is great news. Jesus is walking in the middle of Hinton Alliance Church right now. He knows your church. He knows your visions. He knows your aspirations. And, and, and <laughs> hear me, Kevin Nickel, you know, you're my buddy, I love you. He is at work in your church and he is at work in your community. In fact, Greg Fink says it this way, Jesus is already on the loose, isn't that good? 
He's out there in our neighborhoods, our workplaces and schools. He's already doing the heavy lifting of working in the lives of those around us. And this is the key. He invites us to join him in that work. A posture of hunger, a posture of humility, and finally a posture of hope. No wonder after seeing that vision, does John end up face down on the ground? But what happens next is stunning. John is touched by the one who holds the planets. Oh, John is touched by the one who holds the keys. He then placed his right hand on me. The right hand is the hand of the warrior, the hand of power, the hand of authority. That's the hand that is being placed on the church right now in this moment. And then the words, do not be afraid. Jesus says, I am the first and I am the last. I am the living one. Oh, I was dead, but now look, command, Hinton Alliance Church, look, Jesus is alive forever and ever, and he holds the keys. My wife thinks I'm weird, because sometimes I get out of bed in the morning and I put my hand above my hair, and she goes, what are you doing? I'm reminding myself that Jesus holds the keys. Literally, this is what Jesus is saying. Stop being afraid. Look, I have the keys. Uh, this is a, a declaration of victory, and the picture is this, that Jesus was crucified. He entered into the realm of death and Hades, but hallelujah, death could not hold him. He rose from the dead as the conquering king. Hallelujah. And Fred Hartley says, and he grabbed the keys of death and Hades with his own bare hands. Oh, friends, this phrase, I hold the keys, is a lion-hearted roar, a declaration of authority, power, and victory. It is the fire that stirs the mission passion within us to reach the nations because Jesus has broken the power of sin and hell and death. And hear this now, in the midst of not only a pandemic, but an epidemic of fear in our world, fear has lost its hold because Jesus rose from the dead. The danger though, is to simply rely on our own perspective in order to try to stabilize things and fail to access God's perspective in order to maximize things. You know, I gotta admit to you, the last, the last 15 months for an extrovert like me has been really tough. I feel like I'm an extrovert on a starvation diet and some of you can really relate to this right now. I mean, prior to the pandemic, I was, I was speaking in churches, I was seeing people come to faith. I, the last time I preached, uh, I was, it was in an Iranian church and seven people came to know Christ that morning. I, was, I felt like I was sitting on the edge of what God was doing with, with breakthrough after breakthrough after breakthrough and then immediately it stopped. And I got discouraged. I felt the weight of accumulated losses. During that time, we actually moved to a different location, a different town about 20 minutes from where we lived. And, and all of a sudden I had this stunning revelation. I have been a lousy neighbor because I'm never home. I we travel about 70% of the time. So I'm the neighbor that drops in, says hi, and then leaves. Nobody knows us, right? But now I'm home every weekend. And so I had to learn to be a good neighbor. <laughs> this, is, this is a new learning curve for me right now. And as I was sort of commiserating and struggling with my new reality, Jesus simply said these words, open your eyes. And I saw my neighbor and I began a conversation with my neighbor and he shared a little bit of his story, how his teenage son had committed suicide, how their family had been decimated, how he was deep in grief and felt hopeless. And as I began to build a friendship with my neighbor, I'll never forget the day, just, just about two feet from here on my deck where I'm sitting, where we were chatting together and I shared that Jesus Christ is the one who died to pay for his sins and Jesus Christ is the hope of the world. Jesus Christ is the healer. All the things, Kevin, that you were saying a few minutes ago, minutes ago I, I shared with my neighbor and I said to him, would you like to enter into a personal relationship with Jesus? Here was the most amazing thing. He looked at me and said, I, I would, but I don't know how to do that. And I said, I think I can help you with that. And I, I led him in a prayer and I watched him go from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. In an hour from now, I'll join our church service, which meets in the afternoon and I'll sit beside my neighbor. My, my mission field, you guys, was five steps from my door. I didn't see it. Hinton Alliance Church, what do you see? 
Have you been touched by the one who holds the keys? You see, mission focused passion is not based on the changing of our circumstances. And let me be clear, I pray every day, may COVID-19 be over. But that's not the condition of re-energizing our mission focused passion. It's rather standing firm on the unchanging reality that the one who holds the keys holds us. But it gets better. Ready a simulator plane. Are you ready? Here we go. Because <laughs> the one who holds the keys dwells in us. Paul and We've been raised up with him. We are seated with him in the heavenly realms. Louis Giglia said it this way. It is not just Jesus and me. Wouldn't that be significant? Oh, he says it's even better. It's Jesus in me. Bernie Vanderwell, a good theologian, friend of mine, one of our district superintendents said, it is not just life from Christ, but the very life of Christ. Christ himself that the Christian receives. George Partington, a great theologian from the past in, in, in our Alliance history said, it is not imitation, but incarnation. We don't just try to copy Christ, rather his life is reproduced in us by the work of the Holy Spirit. Is that not stunning, you guys? <laughs> the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is at work in us. Oh, dear friends, not only don't be afraid, be courageous. Be filled with holy boldness today. Two years ago when I turned 60, I had something on my bucket list. I wanted to go skydiving. Kevin Nickel, I know you would have tried to talk me out of this, but I tell you, I was committed. I wanted to go skydiving, to jump out of a plane at 10,000 feet. So I talked to Agnes. She made sure our insurance was all paid up and we were ready to go. And so... Uh, so I went to a, a particular place where they train you and take you for a skydiving experience all in one afternoon. And I, I went for the training. It was going to be a tandem jump. And so they paired me with Nick. Nick is a wide-eyed, fully tattooed South African that has jumped out of a plane probably six to 7,000 times. And each time he jumps out of the plane, it's like his first. He was an enthusiast. Well, we were strapped together in this very sophisticated harness. And as we're uh, now getting at 10,000 feet, I'm, I'm watching people begin to jump out of the plane and we are the last ones to jump out. And just before we jump out, I have this epiphany, this revelation. And I say to Nick, you have to yell because everything's really loud at this point. I said, Nick, when we jump out of this plane, because I am linked to you, all your experience, wisdom and strength and expertise actually becomes mine. And Nick laughed hysterically and he said, yes, and all your liabilities become mine. It's the exchange life. Do you get this? Because we are in Christ and Christ is in us because we are dynamically united with him through the work of the Holy Spirit. We get his strength. We get his love. We get his grace everything we need to be on mission in the midst of a global pandemic. As we got to the door, Nick could tell that I was getting a little more fearful. <laughs> and as I gazed out and looked down at the, the earth that was spiraling before me, I started to panic and Nick said something very counterintuitive to me. He yelled out as loud as he could, rest your head on my shoulder. Okay, here we go. I'd known Nick for 45 minutes, and I was ready to rest my head on his shoulder, put my entire life in his hands after 45 minutes. I've known Jesus for over 50 years. Sometimes I can't trust him. <sighs> Could it be that Jesus in this moment is saying to you, Hinton Alliance Church, as you look at, we don't know, future uncertain, we're not sure what it's all gonna look like. Could it be that Jesus is, oh, do you hear his voice? <laughs> Speaking to you as a congregation saying, rest your head on my shoulder, I got this. And as I rested my head on Nick's shoulders, then he said the next word, jump. Don't, don't miss this. Because Jesus never leaves you with rest your head on my shoulders. 
His next word is jump. Jump into the adventure. Jump into what I've got planned for you. Jump into the opportunities and open doors that I have created in this moment. I really love you guys. Oh, I wish I could be there. One day we'll make it happen again. I just know this for sure. But my prayer is, God, open your eyes today to see the awe-inspiring Jesus at this moment. Oh, the risen and glorified one, shining like the sun with fire in his eyes, holding in his hands the keys of death and Hades, walking in the middle of his churches, filling us with mission, focus, passion. And jump. Spirit of the living God, capture us in this moment. Wherever we're listening, open our eyes to see the glory of Jesus as he is now. And in seeing his glory, radically surrendering to him, with hunger and with humility and with hope. And courageously jumping into what is next. In Jesus name I pray, amen. Thank you, Dave Hearn. That was so good. Your joy and enthusiasm. We want that. What an anointed word.
portion and he is our prize drawn to redemption by the grace in his eyes if grace is an ocean we're all sinking so heaven meets earth like an unforeseen kiss and my heart turns violently inside of my chest i don't have time to maintain these regrets when i think about the way that he loves us oh how he loves us oh how he loves us oh how he loves Thank you, my good brother in Christ, Dave, for encouraging us by what we see. It starts there. And I love your question. Hinton Alliance Church, what do you see? Jesus is already on the loose in our midst and in our town. Do you see him? What are you looking at? Father, we just now humbly come admitting we've been distracted by so many things when only one thing is necessary in this moment what do we who do we see who do we see father we thank you for this good wholesome encouraging enriching and dynamic presentation from your word this morning from the book of revelation our hearts our desire is to be like Zacchaeus who scurried up a tree so he could see you. That's what we want, Lord. So this morning, again, as we just close our service this morning, oh Lord, minister to your people. Fill us fresh. Fill us with a fresh vision of you. Fill us with an overwhelming sense of your presence, not just among us, but within us. Captivating our hearts, captivating our desires, captivating our imaginations, and setting them free. So that we emerge from this lockdown slash restricted season with greater fire from the Holy Spirit than before. This is our prayer, O oh God. Send your spirit now for Christ's sake. Send your spirit now for Christ's sake. Send your spirit now for Christ's sake in this town and in this place we lift you up and worship you and so now we jump we jump from this building into the town into whatever's next we go as you said to go and make disciples of all nations 
and to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and to teach them everything that you have commanded us. And you will be with us to the very end of the age. Come, Lord Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, thank you all for coming today. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you and give you shalom, peace. All right. Thank you again for coming today. Thank you for being with us online. The Lord bless you as well. It's good to have you there. <laughs>